This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, in our first session together, looking at IHT, we learned that for IHT to arise, there had to be a transfer of value being made by the taxpayer. And we learned that a transfer of value was basically a gift, a gift that could, of course, be made either in lifetime or more likely for most taxpayers on death. And that transfer of value was usually equal to the market value of whatever the asset was that was being transferred. But we had to learn how to apply the proper definition of a transfer of value, which, of course, is the loss to the estate of the donor. And that was a simple enough calculation. If you knew, of course, to do the calculation, being simply the difference between what the taxpayer had before the transfer and what the taxpayer had after the transfer. The most usual situation in which that particular principle is tested is when dealing with a lifetime transfer where the taxpayer gives some but not all of their shares in an unquoted company. And that is where you do discover, as we saw in that example, that illustration one last time, that we do not have the same value of the asset that is being transferred being equal to the transfer of value. Because what we had before, less what we have afterwards, may be significantly greater than the mere market value of what is being transferred. Again, if you have any doubts on that system, that principle, go back and look at the exercise we did last time. And that transfer of value will arise by the gift, of course, as we said, of an asset, either in lifetime and or on death. Again, a full uh, section B 10 mark question in relation to IHT. Well, that's likely to be, of course, containing both a lifetime gift and indeed the estate at death. In terms of a section A individual two mark objective testing question, you could be asked to deal with just an individual transfer and given information about prior transfers that may have been made. And again, computing whether or not there be any tax in lifetime and or any tax on death. So we will have gifts being made either in lifetime or on death. In lifetime, we defined those three types of lifetime transfer that you might meet within a question. Those that were simplest to deal with, the exempt transfers, the transfers to your spouse or civil partner. They were exempt, end of story. No chargeability when made, no chargeability on death. There were then chargeable lifetime transfers. Those were just one thing, transfers into trusts. And their name is a bit of a clue as regards what you have to do. They are chargeable lifetime transfers. So they are chargeable when made. How they're taxed when made, that's for later. It's not something we've already done. It's not even something we'll be doing in this particular session. That will come in a later session. But there will be, on a transfer into trust, a computation to be done to determine was there any tax to pay in lifetime. But then we have, in addition to CLTs, the only other and the third and final category of lifetime transfers, which is basically everything other than transfers to spouses, transfers to trusts. These are potentially exempt transfers, transfers to any other individual other than your spouse, and obviously not into trust, it's to an individual. These are pets, potentially exempt, which means when they're made, being potentially exempt, there is no immediate IHT. And they only become chargeable if you die within, well, I hope you're saying there, seven years of the date of death. So with those three types of lifetime transfer. And then on top of that, the death estate. For most taxpayers, estates above, their only transfers of value will arise as a result of their death. And we had some basic examples of that at the end of the last session. Let's have a look, therefore, in just a bit more detail at the death estate. It is, as we say, just a listing exercise, and it's basically like a balance sheet for the taxpayer, establishing their net asset value at the date of death. On death, the assets owned by the deceased are valued and included within the death estate. If a property, and usually there is a property being held in the estate, 
If that is mortgaged, most people, of course, have mortgages on their property, then the mortgage will reduce the property value if it is a repayment mortgage or it is an interest only mortgage. But there's when one special name that you have to watch out for. You don't have to know what it is or understand anything about it. It's a label. And that's something called an endowment mortgage. These are not deducted as they are repaid on death by what is a life assurance part of that mortgage. Again, how it works, you don't have to worry about. All you need to know is that if you are dealing with here is a property valued at £400,000. It has a mortgage on it of 100000 If that mortgage is, um, again, a repayment or an interest-only uh, mortgage there, um, if it is anything other than endowment mortgage, you take the 100 away from the 400000 and include within the death estate the net value of 300000 If, as we've said here, it's an endowment mortgage, then they are not deducted as it will be repaid anyway by a separate life policy that is a part of the endowment mortgage and that would pay off the mortgage, i.e. if the mortgage is paid off as a result of your death, it isn't therefore outstanding at that point of death. Therefore, you just include £400,000 property within the estate. The estate should also include the proceeds of any separate life assurance policy on the deceased life. They might also give you another figure, the market value of the policy at the date of death. You ignore that. Now, everything else that you have, you want the market value at the date of death, otherwise known as the probate value. The probate value, that's the market value at the date of death. That's what you include within the death estate. But if you've got this separate life policy, it's the proceeds proceeds of which policy would have been paid some weeks or months after the death of the taxpayer because of the death of the taxpayer. The value of the estate, as we said, will be reduced by any legally enforceable debts due at the date of death. For example, your credit card bills there, or indeed any other tax bills. Uh, prior to you dying, you wouldn't necessarily, probably wouldn't have been high on your list here, of things to do on your bucket list before you go, I must tidy up and clear up any, in, uh, any uh, tax liabilities that I owe to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Don't think we're going to worry too much about that one. But those, if you were told, had an income tax liability, whatever it might be, a CGT liability of, if you had such tax liabilities, then they are liabilities. They have to be paid. You dying doesn't change that. In which case, they would reduce the value of the estate at death. What you'd also have is plus, well, reasonable funeral expenses. I don't suspect there will have anything other than reasonable funeral expenses. And by exempt bequests. We already know, of course, that the exempt bequest that we are usually looking at is transfers to spouses or civil partners there. And as we said, bequests are exempt, IHT, if made to a spouse or civil partner. Once we've established the value of the chargeable estate from that exercise, we then take the available nil rate band and deduct it from the value of that chargeable estate. Now, the nil rate band itself, and it is given on your uh, rates and allowances page provided to you in the exam, not that I think you'll need it then, it is £325,000 and has been so for a very, very long time. Now, I use the expression available nil rate band. That's 325,000, the nil rate band, reduced by the value of any lifetime chargeable transfers made by the deceased in the seven years before death. The balance of the estate is then taxed at 40%. If lifetime transfers within the seven years before death had been, say, 400,000, they would have fully used the 325 nil rate band, meaning all of the chargeable estate is now going to be taxed at 40%. If there'd been no lifetime transfers in the seven years before death, then all of the nil rate band will be available against the chargeable estate. So the first 325 of the chargeable estate will be at that nil rate. If I'd had, as we said before last time, 
£125,000 worth of lifetime transfers made within the seven years before the date of death, that would use 125 out of 325, leaving 200,000 nil rate bound to then be applied against that or on that chargeable estate at death. As well as establishing there the available nil rate bound, for individuals dying from the 6th of April 17, you're going to see your taxpayer dying in the current tax year. There is an additional residence nil rate band. Again, I mentioned this brief at the end of last session. That amounts to £175,000 for our tax year 2021 there, the 2020-21 tax year. Now then, this residence nil rate band is obviously very specific, is only available where a main residence, it will be clear in the question that it is your main residence, is held within the death estate and is inherited by direct descendants. You leave within your death estate your main residence to a direct descendant, to your kids, to your grandchildren, or any combination thereof, but a direct descendant. And as I've just said, the examiner stated that the question will make it clear if the residence nil rate band is available. Therefore, you should assume that the residence nil rate band is only available if there is mention of the main residence. It will be called the main residence there. It wouldn't be available, for example, on a holiday home or rental property that was owned by the taxpayer at the date of death. This is purely on the main residence of the taxpayer. As we said, the value of that main residence is after deducting any repayment mortgage or interest only mortgage secured on that property. If a main residence is valued after, of course, deduction of the mortgage at less than the available residence nil rate band, then the residence nil rate band is reduced to the value of the residence. So if my residence nil rate band is 175,000 and the value of my main residence is 150,000, then I have residence nil rate band of 150. I can't have the other 25,000 against any other assets held within my estate. It's limited to the value of that residence. Maximum 175. Now I say maximum 175, you will recall, and as we'll see just a, uh, a little bit later here within this lecture, uh, what we may have is either an unused nil rate band or an unused residence and or an unused residence nil rate bound of the spouse of the taxpayer who now dies, but that spouse has predeceased this taxpayer's death, predeceased, and they hadn't used all of their available nil rate band and or residence nil rate band. Then there may be in addition now to this taxpayer's own uh, nil rate band own residence nil rate band, there may be an addition to that for the unused residence nil rate band, nil rate band of the predeceased spouse. If therefore you had a situation where first spouse died, leaving everything to the surviving spouse, that was an exempt transfer, therefore none of their nil rate band or residence nil rate band had been used, if of course, as is usually the case, the spouse jointly owned the property together. So what would happen? That would mean that 100% of their nil rate band and residence nil rate band, 100% was unused. So when it came now to dealing with your taxpayer, the, up until this date anyway, the surviving spouse of the two taxpayers concerned. But now the surviving spouse dies, not only does he or she, probably she is usually he that predeceases there, <laughs> and on that basis you could have not just your, uh, sorry, your nil rate band of 325, you could have 
100% extra on that. So another 325, that's 650. Not only your residence nil rate band, 175, you could have that increased by 100%. That therefore would go up to, what's that, 350,000 pounds. 650, 350, you could have a million pounds worth of a state that was covered by those respective nil rate bands. Residence nil rate band, purely specific to that main residence, limited to the value of the main residence if necessary. And then against any assets held within the death estate, your normal nil rate band. But that could potentially double up on the normal figures of 325 and 175 if 100% of the predeceased spouse's nil rate bands were unused and therefore transferred now to the surviving spouse. But we'll deal with that uh, again later in this session. But once you have computed the amount of IHT, as with any tax, once you've calculated the amount of tax that is to be paid, then there may be a requirement to say when that amount would be payable and potentially by whom. And that's this last little point here. The IHT liability has to be paid by personal representatives, They're sometimes referred to as executors. Personal representatives or executors, before they get letters of probate, allowing the estate to be distributed. Yeah, letters of probate. I referred earlier to a probate value. That's the market value of assets held at the date of death. Until those letters of probate are granted, there will be no right to distribute the estate to the beneficiaries. The IHT liability therefore has to be paid by the personal representatives before they are allowed to distribute that estate. But is anyway due six months after the end of the month in which the taxpayer died. If the taxpayer dies in December 2021, six months after the end of the month of death, that would take you to the 30th of June 2022. And at that date, then it becomes payable. If it hasn't been paid by that date, then from that date, there's going to be interest to pay in relation to the unpaid tax. If, of course, after the taxpayer died, the personal representatives have sorted the estate out, it is available for distribution by, say, March of 2022, they will only be allowed to distribute, those assets will only be allowed to go to the surviving beneficiaries if that tax has been paid. So there's very good reason here why the beneficiaries would want the tax to be settled sooner rather than later. Because until that tax is first settled, they don't get their hands on the remaining value of that estate. The IHT is suffered by the beneficiaries, and then is a lovely expression, usually the residuary legatee of the estate, which is the person receiving the balance of the estate after any specific legacies have been paid out. So if therefore, when a taxpayer dies, the taxpayer says, I want these four people to have these particular items, and then the rest of my estate to go to X, X is the residuary legatee. What it means is the four people to whom specific bequests have been made, those four people will get those assets unencumbered by taxation. So if I left, I had uh, four specific bequests or taxpayers, four specific bequests that he wanted A to have £40,000, uh, V to have 30000 oh, two more letters, F to have 20,000 and C to have 10,000 pounds and X to have everything else, then A, V, F and C, they would get the full value of those gifts without any tax charge. The rest of the estate, after all the IHT had been paid out of the rest of the estate, would go to X, the so-called residual legacy. So the residual legacy is the person who bears that tax. It's paid by the personal representatives, but where does the money come from? It comes out 
of that estate at death, meaning there is less left over to then go to X, that residuary legatee. OK, time now to practice, therefore, our newfound techniques. Here, starting with illustration two, we have the humorously titled Departed here, a spinster. And that simply means that this is a lady who never married. So never married, there is no spouse, there is no former spouse who may have died, significant of which we've mentioned before, but we will see later. So this uh, single uh, lady, single lady, single, she died on the 1st of February 2021, leaving an estate valued at uh, three quarters of a million pounds, 1.75 million, which included her main residence valued at 400,000, so 0.4 million. She had made no chargeable transfers of value in her lifetime and now bequeathed her estate to be split equally between her nieces and nephews. Right, the information that we're picking up then in relation to the requirement, which is to compute the IHT liability arising as a result of D's death, and then state the date by which the liability should be paid. Well, that date by which it should be paid, once we've computed it, six months after the end of the month in which the death occurred. So we've got here, sadly, date of death, 1st of February 2021, Therefore, six months after the end of that month, that would take us through to the 31st of August 2021, when the tax would be due. That's the latest date by which the tax should be paid. As we see, she's a spinster, never married. Uh, again, I've mentioned it. We've, we've not yet seen the detailed note on it. That comes just a little bit later <coughs> in this section. But if she had been married and the former spouse had died before her, then the possibility of an unused nil rate band would exist. Plus, of course, if she had any children via that marriage, we would presume, then the possibility of leaving the residence to a direct descendant in the form of the kids, that would bring in the prospect of the residence nil rate band. So we don't have any of those issues here. She is a, a single lady, single. She's a single lady here, and uh, she's left her estate of 750. We've got no lifetime transfers having been made, and we've got everything being left to the nieces and nephews. So what have we got? Chargeable estate at death, inclusive of the 400,000 pounds of main residence, 750,000 pounds. The fact that there is a main residence here does not in this example give rise to the availability of the residence nil rate ban. Why? Because it's not left to a direct descendant, it's left instead to nieces and nephews. If it had been kids, grandchildren, etc., that would be fine. So there's no residence nil rate ban. There are no lifetime transfers that have been made in the seven years before death from the information provided here, and therefore at death we have a fully available nil rate band of 325,000 at nil, obviously nil. Take the 325 away from the charge of a state of 750, and that leaves us with 425, which is now pushed into the 40% rate bracket, a serious rate of tax. And that therefore gives rise to £170,000 liability. Now, this is as basic as we can get, but it's the building block for what we're going to go on to do in more, dare I call them, interesting examples there. No lifetime transfers. She dies as a single person. There is no spouse. There are no exempt transfers to spouses. There's no residence nil rate band available. There's no unused nil rate bands from a former spouse. So she's got her nil rate band. That's it. Thereafter, it's 40%. As we said here, the residence nil rate band is not available because it's not being left to a direct descendant. Why? Because there isn't a direct descendant. The personal representatives will then be required to pay that liability of 170, as we said, six months by at least, late estate, six months after the end of the month in which the death occurred. And that therefore would be by the 31st of August uh, 2021. Where does the tax come out of? It's the personal representatives who pay. Well, the money ain't coming out of their pockets, so it will be paid out of the estate and hence is borne by the nieces and nephews. 
if there was an estate valued at £750,000, if that is what the full estate was worth, and there's now a tax liability of 170, then what would go to the beneficiaries, the nieces and nurses, uh, nieces and nurses, the nieces and nephews there, would be the 750 minus 170. The residue, therefore, of that estate would be paid out to them, but only, of course, after the tax of 170 had been paid. Right, we now move on to illustration three, and this time we do make it that she is married. D was married at her date of uh, death and left her entire estate to her children. And that's the point. She's married, so there's no prior death of a spouse. The spouse still uh, lives there, but she's left her entire estate to her children. And as soon as you see that the estate is being left to the children, then you want to know what is in that estate and whether or not a main residence is involved. And that, that means, of course, there was here. Then, as her main residence was left to her direct descendants, the residence nil rate band would apply. So the IHT would now be computed as. So what does she have available? All of her nil rate band, all of her residence nil rate band. Remember, the residence, the main residence, was valued, I think, at £400,000. So that will fully consume the 175 and therefore the, the full 175 is available. That's a total of 500,000 at the nil rate band, leaving out of the 750, 250,000 pounds to be taxed at 40%. That therefore will be 100,000 pounds liability. Again, that money having to be paid over by the personal representatives before the balance then of the estate can be paid out to the kids. So the only difference there is we do have a residence nil rate band. On to illustration four, which is the same as we've had going with illustration two there. Now with illustration two, remember we've got the 750,000 pound estate. We've got a 400,000 pound main residence. There were no lifetime transfers. And in illustration two, where was the estate left to? The nieces and nephews there. But what we have this time is that D had made a chargeable transfer of value in lifetime. That chargeable transfer of value amounting to 200,000. You know that there has to be a transfer of value for any IHT implications to arise. From labels that we ascribed earlier to the type of lifetime transfer you could be dealing with, then we would know that that transfer that has occurred, given the information we've been provided with there, would simply be a potentially exempt transfer. In any exam question, you'd be told that D had made a transfer, told what the asset was, you would work out the transfer of value, you would work out the chargeable transfer, and you'd also then be able to label whether that was a CLT or a PET. This one is a potentially exempt transfer. For it to be a CLT, I hope you recall, that had to be very specifically a transfer into a trust. So the difference this time, lifetime transfer becomes chargeable on death because this was made in June 2019 and we know that she died sadly in February of 2021. That is clearly within the seven years before death. How do we now compute the IHT liability arising as a result of D's death? What we learnt about the nil rate band and about this tax, remember we said that uh, uh, this tax that we deal with is a cumulative donor-based tax. It's cumulative. So now we've got, prior to dealing with the estate at death, to deal with a separate computation, there'll be no tax upon it, which would be the lifetime transfers chargeable on death. The lifetime transfer made in the seven years before death was £200,000. That is less than 325, so it will use up 200 of the 325,000 nil rate band meaning that there will be no tax to pay on it. 
and that will leave only £125,000 of available nil rate band then to go against the estate at death. So, as the chargeable transfer made in lifetime falls within the seven years before the date of death, it will become chargeable as a result of D's death. Again, I've given you the chargeable transfer of value in an exam question. You may have had to have worked that out for yourself. It will, however, fall within the nil rate band of 325 in force at the date of death, so no IHT will be payable thereon. Don't worry, further illustrations we'll move on to will have more than one lifetime transfer. But as regards the nil rate band, it is applied on a strictly chronological basis. Whatever was the earliest lifetime transfer chargeable on death that was made within the seven years before death, whatever was the earliest one, would get the first use out of the nil rate band. You then go forward on a chronological basis using up that nil rate band against further later lifetime transfers, should there be more than one, before then moving to the estate at death. Here, there is only one lifetime transfer, it's 200, well within the nil rate band, leaving just 125,000 of that nil rate band to go against your chargeable estate at death. As we said, all of that uh, pet that chargeable lifetime, sorry, the chargeable transfer of value made in lifetime, all of that is within the nil rate band. It means that only 125,000 now of the nil rate band will be available in taxing the estate at death. So we'll now read 125 at nil out of the same 750,000. So 625 is now pushed into the 40% band, increasing the tax liability to 250,000 pounds. So although you've still got the self-same chargeable estate, it's 750, the tax on that cannot be computed in isolation because you need to know, do we have all or any part of the nil rate band available? Knowing now, as we've said before, but seen here, that that nil rate band is applied firstly to lifetime transfers made within the seven years before death. And as we'll see next, if there's more than one of them, then it would be applied strictly on a chronological basis. Before we see multiple lifetime transfers within the seven years before death, we have mentioned this before. Now we need to look at the detailed note on it. And that is the prospect of the transfer of an unused nil rate band on the death of one spouse to the surviving spouse. When that surviving spouse eventually dies, they may get up to 100% extra availability in terms of their nil rate band. And as we'll see later in these notes, the same rule would be applicable to the resident's nil rate band. So if any amount of a taxpayer's nil rate band is unused on their death, then the proportion, come back to that in a minute, of their nil rate band that is unused will transfer to their spouse or civil partner. Looking now at illustration five, we're back to illustration two, but we're now going to make it that D was a widow and had received all of her husband's estate on his earlier death, and he had made no lifetime gifts. The husband would have made no chargeable transfers, as transfers between spouses are exempt. So, if the only transfers made are exempt transfers, there will be no use on the husband's uh, previous death there. There will be no use of his nil rate band. So, this would mean that 100% of his nil rate band would have been unused. As D has then died, a claim may be made, not only may, will be made here, for the unused proportion, i.e. all of it, 100% of the husband's nil rate band to transfer over to D. Thus D's nil rate band will now be, she has 325 plus 100% of that 325. And I say of that 325, again the point here, Note that irrespective of the level of nil rate band that existed at the date of her husband's death, 
D will now benefit from an extra 100% of the available nil rate band when she dies. So if when the husband sadly hurt died many years before, if back at that point in time, the then nil rate band was £300,000, then it doesn't matter that it was 300, that it is now 325, this will still be an extra 100% of 325. We do not transfer the amount of unused nil rate band, we transfer the proportion of the unused nil rate band. What was the proportion? If as here, husband had made no use of his then nil rate band, say £300,000, to take it as a lower number, and one that did exist many years ago, then 100% is unused, and whether it's now 325 or whether it's 350000 in the future, then when D died, she would get her own then available nil rate band, plus 100% extra of that current nil rate band because all of the 100% was unused at the time of the husband's death. If again, using the nil rate band of uh, 300,000 when husband died, if he had used half of his nil rate band, so 150,000 pounds of transfers had been made, say, to the children directly, that therefore is not covered by the spouse exemption, so that would have been chargeable. So that would leave a further 50%, a further half of the 300,000 nil rate band unused. So what would now happen, this would now read here, not 100%, but 50%. Again, a common error made by students is when they tell you at the time of the husband's earlier death, the nil rate band was 300,000. The students want to transfer that or how much of the 300 was then unused. No. It is the proportion. In this example, it is simple. 100% was unused. What does D now get? 100% of the current 325 nil rate band as the extra nil rate band, the transferred amount, not 300. If husband had used half of his nil rate band of 300, that's not 150 left over. It is 50% unused. Therefore, 50% of 325 is now what would be available. So on that basis, what have we got? 325 plus another 325 is a total of 650. So that's an extra 325,000 pounds of nil rate band saving tax at 40%. That would save 130. Well, what would it be? There was 750,000 charge of the state minus 650 nil rate band equals 100 taxed at 40%. That would be 40,000 pounds. I think you'll find if you look back at uh, illustration two, we had £170,000 worth of tax at the time. We have now just said a saving of 130 from 170 there, that would be £40,000 of tax. And there was the makeup of that £40,000 of tax. Hugely beneficial, therefore. But we don't finish there, because just as any unused normal nil rate band can be transferred to a surviving spouse or civil partner, so too can the residence nil rate band. It is also transferable if unused. And again, it does not matter when the first spouse died. The fact that if the spouse died, as you'll see, before two, April 2017, when we introduced the residence nil rate ban, I mean, to anybody before that, there could have been no use of any residence nil rate ban because it didn't exist back pre-2017. It doesn't matter. If it didn't exist, it wasn't used, therefore 100% was unused. So this gives us the possibility of not just getting, again, as we said earlier, not just getting an extra 100% of the nil rate ban, taking, as you've seen here, 325 up to 650. But if the residence nil rate band is available, if it is available, then that means that 175 can be up to 350. So potentially 
for taxpayers when the surviving spouse dies, having previously not used any of his or her nil rate bands, that's going to leave now, in current day terms, a million pounds worth of nil rate band to the surviving spouse. That will do nicely. Will you would not agree? Right, let's just see how this works, therefore. We're now going to go back to illustration three above, where D was a widow when she died. Therefore, there had been a former husband. And her husband had made full use of his normal nil rate band on his earlier death. He had fully used his nil rate band, so 300,000 or 325,000, whatever use, all of the nil rate band had been used then the IHT computation would be as follows. So the nil rate band that we're going to have available, we've got the normal nil rate band for D of 325, nothing extra transferred from the previous deceased husband, plus instead of 175, we've now got 350,000. Hubby therefore had not used any of his uh, residence nil rate band, and that now would allow the extra to be available. Why would it be available? Because what we'd now be saying, of course, is that uh, the uh, property was left to the direct descendants. Uh, only where it is to direct descendants does the residence nil rate band become available. So the application of these nil rate bands is hugely important to us. As we have just seen, in terms of the nil rate band, it is available on death, but is firstly applied to the lifetime transfers that become chargeable as a result of the death. And as we'll see shortly, that those, uh, the application rather, of that normal nil rate band would be on a first in, first out basis that over the seven years before death, what was the earliest transfer made, if there was more than one, and then it would take the first use of the 325,000 nil rate band. It would take the first use, or indeed whatever the nil rate band may be at that point in time. Um, with the residence nil rate band, remember the residence nil rate band is not available against lifetime transfers. The residence nil rate band is only available where the main residence is a part of the estate at death. It's a part of the chargeable estate. And it is left to a direct descendant. Then it is available. Those are the only circumstances in which it would be available. So we've got here that she's got her own full nil rate band plus her own residence nil rate band times two plus the extra 100%, which leaves only 75 thousand out of the 750 to be taxed at 40 percent and therefore a mere 30,000 pounds worth of liability. But I repeat, the nil rate band, whether it is 325 or whether it is anything between 325 and 650 because of the transfer of the unused proportion of the previously deceased spouse's nil rate band, the amount that was unused, whatever it is, goes firstly against the lifetime transfers in the seven years before death, and only then any balance against the estate at death. The residence nil rate band is only available against the death estate, and only available where the main residence is a part of that estate and is gifted to a direct descendant. But then, of course, maybe not just the 175, but up to 350,000, up to an extra 100% in relation to an unused residence nil rate band by the previously deceased spouse. You will recall that we said that lifetime transfers may be uh, itemised as one of three types of such transfer. They're either exempt transfers, as we've seen, transfers to spouses and civil partners. They could be chargeable lifetime transfers, CLTs, 
but they are only transfers into trust. But the vast majority of lifetime transfers are not going to be uh, transfers into trust and will not be in an exam question simply transfers to a spouse. They're going to be transfers to other individuals, whether it's the kids, whether it's nieces and nephews, whoever it might be. And those, all those other transfers come under the title of potentially exempt transfers or pets as we know them. I think that's probably enough for this particular session, but next time, as you can see, we will then look in more detail, firstly, at those pets and see there the situation where we have more than one lifetime transfer becoming chargeable on death so that we can witness this cumulative nature of this donor-based tax as the nil rate band is applied chronologically from the earliest lifetime transfer in the seven years before death through to the latest one in the seven years before death. All that and much more next time around.